Aloha, Inspired Money Makers. Welcome to Inspired Money, where we talk about everything from money mindset to financial independence to making a difference, making an impact, and leaving a legacy. I'm your host, Andy Wong, financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. And this episode is focused on financial empowerment for women, bridging the gender wealth gap. Did you know that next week, Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, is Equal Pay Day? National Equal Pay Day symbolizes how far into the year the average woman must work to earn what the average man earned in the previous year. On average, women make 16% less than their male counterparts for the same work. This gap is even worse for mothers at 29%, Black women at 31%, Native women at 41%, and Latina women at 43%. Progress is being made, though. According to analysis by the Financial Times, the very large gender gap in the tech sector has narrowed across the US, the EU, and the UK in the past four years. The numbers that I read yesterday were that women held 35% of tech jobs in the US at the end of 2023, and that's up from 31% in 2019. That's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Men still dominate employment in the sector. And that's led to calls for greater diversity in hiring at a time when industry is developing crucial new artificial intelligence technologies. Personally, I'm happy to see the progress, but there's a lot more work to be done. I posted about the FT article on LinkedIn yesterday, and I was surprised at some of the comments. First, I didn't realize this could be a triggering topic for some people. Second, there was some mansplaining happening in the comments. Uh, that was new to me. But I'm personally interested in the topic as a father of a son and two daughters. I want to create a world where they have opportunities to realize their dreams and follow their passions. So let's jump right in because we've got a stellar panel. Let's welcome everyone. We'll start with Dr. Judith Wright. She's a celebrated educator, speaker, and author renowned for her ex expertise in personal development, relationships, and transformative leadership. The San Francisco Chronicle said she's one of the most sought after self-help gurus in the country. And Women's World Magazine called her the world's ultimate expert. Judith founded Sophia, the Society of Femininity in Action. I always have trouble saying femininity. Uh, and the organization provides revolutionary leadership training for women and women's empowerment. Judith, welcome back to Inspired Money. It's so great to have you on the panel. It's great to be with you, and I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. We have Mariko Gordon back on Inspired Money again. She's a chartered financial analyst and finance maverick who founded a $2.5 billion money management firm from scratch. She now mentors entrepreneurs, advocates for women's empowerment, and offers personalized investment advice and financial planning at her registered investment advisory firm. Let's see if I can say this one, Uzume LLC. Did I get it close? You did. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, Mariko, I'm so glad that you're back. And now you're an old pro. You've got your headphones, your mic, and everything. You look and sound great. And then for the first time, I'm excited to welcome Stephanie O'Connell Rodriguez who I've been wanting to get on Inspired Money for a long time. Uh, she's a personal finance expert, award-winning writer, a keynote speaker. Her insights have graced publications like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Bloomberg, while her appearances on ABC World News, Fox Business, and the Dr. Oz Show, among other places, have made her the go-to millennial expert on money. She's also the co-founder of Statement Event, a series dedicated to advancing gender equity, and financial empowerment. Stephanie, we get a two for one. You're a panelist, but yes. so is your baby. So is my baby. Hopefully not in the shot, but we might hear the baby on audio. And I really think that's this captures the essence of this conversation of what it really means to manage your money and participate in the labor force as a woman. That's for sure. Well, we look forward to having all the panelists' insights I'm going to be trying to listen and learn. So let's go straight into segment one. The gender wealth gap 
extending well beyond income disparities to total wealth accumulation is a pressing issue requiring multifaceted solutions. Government policies are instrumental in bridging this gap. Equal pay legislation ensures women have the same financial opportunities as men, a crucial step for equitable wealth building. Family leave policies support women in balancing work and family commitments, preventing career breaks that can impede long-term wealth accumulation. The financial sector plays a pivotal role. Tailored financial advice and products catering to women's needs and risk profiles can empower them in wealth building. Education and proactive financial management are equally crucial. Women must not only understand their finances, but also advocate for systemic changes fostering financial empowerment. Closing the gender wealth gap is more than a matter of fairness. It's an economic imperative. By implementing supportive policies and fostering an inclusive financial environment, we can enable women to achieve financial stability and independence, benefiting society as a whole. It's great to have this panel of women and one, you know, individuals that are so successful and strong with money. Judith, can you kick us off as founder of a women's leadership program like Sophia? What do you think are the most effective strategies for empowering women to understand and manage their finances? Well, I think that you listed a lot of those in the video, so I was glad to get that summary. It was really well done. But, you know, one of the things I work with that we may not touch otherwise is really like the internal battle for women to have the beliefs about their own value, to really ask for what it is that they need, to negotiate uh, salaries for themselves, to learn how to say no to things that uh, don't help them increase their um, value increase their ability to be promoted. So some of it's an internal battle to really help women to really um, believe in themselves, believe in the power. And part of what I do is help women really discover what their unique gifts are and how when you have more women leaders and more women managers and more women board members, how much better companies operate, how much more money they make, and because of these unique skills of women. So one of it's an inside job of really empowering the women. And then of course, the kinds of things that you're talking about, that we have governmental policies that can help with that, that we learn more about how to provide childcare in ways that can really support women to be more available, that we work with uh, some of the gender bias that we have in our world that are actually still very current and strong and be able to raise that awareness of really seeing the value of the feminine and of women and of women in the workforce and women leaders. And I'm sure other panelists can add a lot more to that. It's a, it's a big job, both externally in structures and our, our policies, but also internally with women and then also raising consciousness within organizations and companies. Yeah, it's interesting to hear about the internal work, and the importance of just having confidence. Stephanie, how can women leverage their financial knowledge to advocate for changes that address this wealth disparity that we see? Well, I think one of the things we need to acknowledge is that a lot of this reporting on a lack of confidence or there being a gender gap in this idea of self-belief really comes down to differences in income. When you control for income levels, you'll see a lot of these quote unquote gender gaps in, in confidence or risk taking. You'll hear my baby here <laughs> chiming in. Um, you'll see a lot of those gaps start to go away. And so I think sometimes we, we extrapolate these assumptions about uh, personality traits related to money or money making or preferences as being related to somebody's gender identity, when in fact they can really be attributable to these other things. And I think we need to be careful when we have these conversations that we're not you know, misattributing things because then we can't come up with really effective interventions. Mm, great point. Mariko, you, you led, like you were on Wall Street advising, you've also advised women on Main Street. I'm curious, like what are key policies and strategies that can help to close the gender wealth gap? Well, I think a lot of it is, um, I mean, it's everything <laughs> that you mentioned in the video. It's systemic, you know, it's structural, it's it's societal norms, it's 
being marinating in the patriarchy. It's uh, what we grew up with culturally. It's it's everything, inside job, outside job. Um, I think to Stephanie's point though, I want, also wanted to add, like there's this perception that women are, are more risk averse investors than men. And actually when they've looked at this carefully, that's not the case. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of assumptions that that can be made that way. I think the biggest thing is just um, some of the myths that we grow up with um, in in families, right, where uh, the boys get everything, or they get the education, or the, the the family investments are made there, and the women, the girls are raised to, oh, you'll be taken care of, you know, your your husband will take care of you, um, you don't need to worry about this stuff. I think I think that if we could just sort of start there, as in everybody should learn how to, how to should expect to. Uh, figure out how to make their financial needs met themselves, and then they can choose from from that. But I think there's a lot. I think let's just let's just even just start there, small. Let's just start at the family, and and give everyone the sort of same opportunities that 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 are non gender based as well. And I'm kind of curious if we can get, just go around really quickly, because you mentioned like the societal expectations or limitations. But you've all excelled as speakers, as educators, in money management, in media. When you were young, when you were young girls, did you feel uh, that you were limited to certain professional paths? And as you found your career path, what kind of um, obstacles did you run into? Um, Judith? It's a really good question. You know, yes, there's obstacles no matter no matter what, and there were for me as well. I think what facilitated my journey is that it came from a long line of working women. So at my mother, my grandmother, my great mother, great grandmother were working women, and they were all single mothers for a long period of time and had to really support their families. And so my and they worked for my mother, my grandmother worked for an all women's insurance company and it had an all women's board. Well, that's before anything like that happened in, in their era. So that helped that I had that. But that doesn't mean that there weren't barriers or for things for me to be looking at. And, you know, and as a young woman coming up into just a lot of biases and uh, disbelief and uh, struggles. And, and it's, it's, it, I felt like I had some advantages from that background, but that doesn't mean that there weren't people that made it very difficult for me. I don't know that I felt limited in what I could accomplish because I really applied myself to really like study hard, make, meet those goals. I really worked hard. So I feel like I could get through things, but I also realized that I was working harder and differently than the men and that the men around me were having the same jobs that were making more money than I. I had men stealing my material. I had things like that. I had to really deal with. And also as a young, young woman, young, single, attractive woman to deal with me too moments and things that were in the, that space that make it really difficult to focus. So yeah, there's real barriers despite, <laughs> despite some capacities. How about you, Mariko? Um, I think very early on, I just realized that a lot of things were just BS. <laughs> so um, it was just like, I wondered, like, why is this the case? I, 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 there was a sort of inbred kind of sense of injustice around it, that your that your gender should determine things and not you, the individual. So even as a little kid, I just remember uh, really questioning the system a lot. I think for me personally, I grew up with, um, my parents had a rental car business in the French Caribbean. And so I grew up literally kind of, um, um, as Stephanie's baby is growing up now, right, in in my parents' business and seeing it operating. But also my dad kind of blew up the business. So I grew up with this really fierce sense of, I am going to control my financial fate. You know, um, so I think part of it is that both a combination of just the illogic of the assumption that just because you're female, you know, uh, certain paths are closed to you, like just really rub me the wrong way very, very early. I mean, I remember distinctly these moments. And the other thing is just my personal family history really contributed a lot to that. Plus I'm stubborn, <laughs> really stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have to no. celebrate that in my kids, even though <laughs> yes, right. it's hard now, but it'll serve them well in the future. Yes. 
Yeah, I similarly had a great role model in my mother. Both of my parents worked. My mother was the breadwinner. Uh, and it also meant that both of my parents were involved in caretaking responsibilities, which I think is an underappreciated piece of this conversation because the work that gets done in the home and caretaking supports the work that's able to be done in the paid labor force. And so to more equitably, to more equitably benefit from the resources of of participating in the paid labor force, we need both partners, men and women, people across gender identity to be engaging in the work of unpaid labor. And we see that even when we research this, daughters raised by employed mothers are also more likely to be employed. They're more likely to hold supervisory responsibilities and earn higher incomes. And sons raised by employed mothers spend more time caring for family members and daughters wind up spending less time on housework. So it's not just our anecdotal experiences here. Uh, this is also borne out in the data across countries. Mm, great point. Let's jump to segment two. Navigating financial planning across life stages is crucial for women, each phase presenting unique challenges and opportunities. Early on, balancing student loans and starting savings are key. Automating savings and understanding investments set a strong foundation. During family planning and motherhood, juggling career and family finances become central. Strategies like education funds and life insurance are important for a stable financial future. Mid-career and approaching retirement, the focus shifts to maximizing retirement savings and diversification of investments. This stage may include caring for aging parents, requiring long-term care insurance considerations, in retirement, managing savings, healthcare costs, and estate planning are paramount. A well thought out retirement income plan and understanding healthcare options ensure financial security. Throughout these stages, the gender pay gap influences savings, investment strategies, and overall financial well being. Women's ability to adapt can be leveraged to meet these diverse financial needs. By recognizing common challenges and employing strategic financial planning, women can achieve financial empowerment and security. Mariko, when you work with women, do you find that it requires specific financial planning advice? And also, how do you give women different financial advice in different stages of their careers? Well, there there are a couple of there are a couple of things. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll I'll talk about five hundred things, but there's like really one thing that I really wanted to focus on, and and that's for women who take time out of of the workforce to to um, to stay home and take care uh, of of the family and household, and um, that there there are certain things that I think help. Uh, because we've we have this weird thing where like women who earn a lot more than their husbands still somehow end up doing more housework than the women who earn less because the, I, they need to prove <laughs> something. I mean, this was an interesting study, right? But um, so so that the non-working spouse that the her labor and contribution to the financial well-being of the family is actually documented, right? So whether that's Every year, you know, when you sit, so first of all, doing money together as a team is really important. So that that's the first thing whenever there's a there's a partnership involved is is really figuring out how to do that. Um, you know, working through conflicts, having transparency, having communication, like really, really doing that well. Given that, then I think once a year, quantifying what it would cost to replace all that labor, uh, that unpaid labor. Because once you put a price tag to that, and it is a big ass price tag, right? It it can be sobering because the person who's like, you know, going to the salt mines, doing the commute, it's like, oh, it's so terrible. It's easy to underestimate the physical labor, the emotional labor, the the cognitive load of of staying home, uh, and you know, with a couple of toddlers all day long, day after day, right? And um, and when you put a price tag on that and 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 do things like contribute to a spousal IRA, right? There's a there's a there's a there's a value that's actually sort of acknowledged tangibly. I think that's important. And then also in life insurance, right? 
that because if the spouse dies, all of that unpaid labor is suddenly going to have to be paid. So that's also another way to make that contribution sort of more real and more tangible. And I, I think that's an important exercise of doing the money together, but also the that that there is that real sense also, again, at home, right, that just because somebody works outside the home doesn't mean that they get to come. This is my, my grandfather on my dad's side, right? He, he, his job was to go and, and, and make money. And my grandmother took care of, controlled every other aspect of his life, <laughs> right? But um, that, that, that's also not fair to the person staying home. So this really kind of getting the sense of being a unit with shared responsibilities all the way through and, and doing it in a tangible way, I think is, is, is key. I'm a real advocate for that. Mm, juggling a lot. Yep. And it's interesting to put it in the context of assigning a dollar of value, a dollar value to that um, really puts things into perspective. Stephanie, what tools and resources do you recommend that women seek to enhance their financial, their financial literacy and their planning skills? Well, I think we need to speak to people where they're at. And this is true for men, women, however they identify with money currently, uh, it's typically not where they want to be in the their ideal or in their future, but we often talk to them like they're coming from a perfectly optimized place already. And I think we need to speak to people first and foremost about their values and what they want their money to do for them. Is this the money that I want to help leave a legacy for my family? Is this the money that I want to support my dream of opening up a business? Is this the money that I want to support me in my retirement? And I see it as traveling the world and doing all these fabulous things. And then once we get excited about the money, then we can dig into the details of how we're going to make it happen. Because I think it's hard to engage in the conversation if we aren't connected to why we're excited about it. And when we're not excited about it, it's easy easy to leave it off of the to-do list for quite a long time. Absolutely. That's totally true. Judith, you do a lot of coaching on yeah. personal development. So I'm curious, how can personal development principles be integrated into financial planning for women? Well, actually, as I've been listening to two of you, I realize how much more it is than I might have been aware of. But you know, I do a lot of couples work. My husband and I, our last book we did together was on couples, The Heart of the Fight. It's a couple's guide to 15 common fights, what they really mean, and how they can bring you closer. And one of the most common fights is dueling over dollars. You know, really those money fights are really, they're just really big issues for relationships. And they're oftentimes things that aren't sorted through. And to Stephanie's point, really looking at what are your values? What do you really value? What is it that that matters to you and many couples many families people they're sharing monetary resources don't look at that they don't sort that through they don't haven't looked at and need to like what do you really value what is and also there's a beyond even with the values is there's an emotional component of what money means to people money times it sometimes means security it means love it means a lot of things to a lot of people and it's a very charged topic so i find really having to work with those issues in relationships to help get that clarity is really important you know and there's a lot of studies about tons about how much um, couples lie about money you know hide their purchases and don't tell the truth about things cover stuff up and to get to that truth is actually really important in a sense of trust and safety where that's something uh, that can be talked about openly and worked through so it's a there's a there's a relationship issue with it that needs to be tended to in order for it to then translate into actually the financial planning and it is easier said than done right it, it's something that has to be a practice and you develop the habit of good communication, uh, specifically about money. Yeah. And it's, you know, looking underneath the fights to whether those fights really about, usually it's just some, it's uh, unexpressed um, values, unexpressed feelings that need to come to the surface. I actually like couples to have fights if they can learn how to really resolve those because the information comes up in that and that they can really start to understand one another and start to get united in their um, economic future. It's good to know that there's a silver lining to those <laughs> conflicts. <laughs> Let's go to segment three. In finance, cultural norms and societal expectations significantly shape women's financial decisions and inclusion. Restrictive social norms often impede women's economic empowerment. 
limiting their work opportunities and engagement with financial services. These barriers lead to a considerable number of women worldwide being excluded from the formal financial system. Addressing these social norms are crucial for advancing women's financial empowerment, shifting perceptions and behaviors in households, communities, and markets are essential to equitable access to financial resources. This transformative change goes beyond providing financial services. It involves a fundamental alteration in societal attitudes and practices. Improving women's financial inclusion requires an understanding of these deep-rooted norms and a collective effort to modify them. By empowering women with equal access to financial opportunities, closing the gender wealth gap and ensuring economic empowerment for women is not just a financial imperative, but a step towards greater societal equity and justice. Stephanie, can you tell us about Statement Event and how it's addressing gender equity, personal finance, and economic policy? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, you're still muted. Yep. Oh, I took my at. hand off my little mute button there. But uh, a lot of things that we like to address is looking at this intersection of identity and personal finance. Because when we talk about money, we often talk about it in terms of the rules we all know, right? To spend less than we earn, to invest, to save. But how do these things actually play out in practice and differently depending on our gender identity, our racial identity, our uh, physical uh, ability, all of these other intersecting identities. And so one of the things that I focus a lot on is gender identity. and your segment here, the intro, you set us up so well, is so much of this isn't about any kind of natural gender difference in terms of who has more interest in earning money or who has more interest in managing money, but it's really about gender roles and the expectations of a culture and what it means to be a man or woman in that culture or to be a good wife or good husband. And unfortunately, even as women have entered the labor force and started to earn more and more money, a lot of the expectations around what it means to be a good wife, for example, are still very rooted in these patriarchal ideals that say to be a wife is to be a submissive to your partner. And it, so if you're the one earning more in the relationship, it can actually trigger a lot of backlash. And we see that women in heterosexual relationships who are breadwinners do experience that in the form of their spouse being more likely to engage in infidelity, being being more likely to be emotionally or even physically abusive. We see uh, pe people's partners being more stressed out if their wives earn more than them. And we don't see those dynamics happen in same-sex relationships, nor do we see them as women's incomes rise so long as they do not surpass that of their male partner. So a lot of this idea that like women are not in interested in engaging in paid work is first of all a myth and then if they do engage in it and they do succeed in it there's this idea that somehow they transform into these different kinds of people but in reality what's happening is they're just experiencing a lot of the social backlash because they're quote unquote violating gender norms judith how, how do you see these restrictive social norms impacting women's financial decisions and what can you actually do? What steps can influence positive change? I think it's a good point. I think Stephanie gave a really good review of all some of these issues. You know, if you look at like gender norms really do affect so many things. It affects your access to resources, your uh, opportunities to develop skills, uh, divisions of labor, your ability to be able to actually act on possible opportunities. And, and as I see it, it also plays out so much in women's roles, like uh, women's leadership or their access to be able to have more leadership roles or to have things that really can actually impact more of their income to develop more of that or to have a sense of um, what they can really be, build their equity. So part of it, I mean, yes, there's so many, and you were saying, Mirko, it's just really like there's so many systemic issues with this that are kind of bigger, the bigger issues. What I tend to work on is really focusing on more on the individual and their own 
own psyche to be able to look at that because it's to really and it's really start to one thing is to realize yes there are these gender norms and they are a problem and they do limit us let's just kind of be aware of that and understand how that is and rather than complain about it or feel sorry for ourselves or rail against it or whatever okay given that this exists what can i do what can I do to be more empowered? What can I do to increase my own sense of value? What can I do to raise the awareness of the people around me? What can I advocate for in my own workplace? How can I bond together with other women to be able to be more of a force? How can we support other women when they're stepping up and be able to be um, advocates for them? How can we mentor more women so that they can have more of success and more of a sense of, of role models? So I look at what we can do for ourselves individually, but then how we can also help and support and empower other women and really raise consciousness in the settings that we find ourselves in. It's really interesting. My oldest daughter, who's 16 now, is a scout in Boy Scouts of America. And she's on the brink of becoming an Eagle Scout. But I see her and her fellow female scouts really, um, you know, confronting these, like, going, they're doing things that uh, are not conventionally thought to be for females, like, they just went camping and my daughter and her friend built their own shelter and slept underneath this, you know, stick and leaves and bark shelter and stayed dry in the rain. And it was incredible. And, you know, they go to um, Philmont and do like a hundred miles of hiking over the course of a week. Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool to see. And I guess at a certain age, I mean, they do like, they wear their scout uniform and they get on the airplane and they say, everyone's staring at us and people ask us questions and they want to know, are you a girl scouts? And we have to say, no, we're BSA scouts. Um, but I think it's nice that they're at a young age where sometimes they're not thinking about it, but inevitably they're aware of the norms and what expectations are. Mariko, can you talk a little bit about what steps women can take to challenge and change these societal expectations, especially when they limit their financial opportunities. Wow, you just presented me with a Kobayashi Maru situation, <laughs> like a no-win situation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Let me think about that one. Um, I, I think I think an I think an important. Um, a, a, a kind of conditioning that is helpful for us to, to be aware of, right, is um, there's a lot of, we, we're, we're, there's a lot of socialization around compliance, right, around conflict avoidance, like, you know, good girls don't rock the boat, uh, you know, you study hard, you, you do what the teacher says and everything, and, and you know, you, 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 you get good grades and maybe you get into professional fields, but you may not um, be, you know, you're not going to to challenge um, authority or, or, or break thinking. So I think part of the thing is, and right, when you're kind of the person where you're always kind of making nice or you're always aware of, uh, of some of the emotional labor that we're, we, we, we tend to be taught and grow up with, you're always kind of monitoring other people's emotional states and things. I'm, again, these are very gross gender, you know, generalizations, but generally speaking, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 the well-being of the ecosystem is often, you know, deeply felt unconsciously just from an expectational kind of a thing that, that we're the ones turning the gears to make all of that go smoothly and thinking things through. Um, and, and, and that can lead to a desire, I think, for uh, um, a kind of both control and a, a, a discomfort with uncertainty. And, I, and, and because of the risk of failure, because the risk of failure is so high for, for, for women. And we, you know, there's just, I mean, it's, our society doesn't tolerate failure really well in some ways. Um, but I think, I think for, 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 for girls, there's a lot, you know, a lot of the kind of disorders that we do see tend to be associated with gender are often related to what I'm talking about here. And so I think 
the the thing that I see because I, I teach women business owners, you know, a class on how to develop financial intimacy with their businesses and 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 all of that. And I think a lot of it is really trusting that you're going to do the best you can to figure things out and you have to get comfortable with failure because if you're not failing uh you know in in ways small and big you're probably not taking enough enough risk uh or you're not growing enough and and that to get comfortable with uncertainty as well too because the you know the desire to control in order to manage your anxiety around getting it wrong right leads to micromanage it leads to sort of the kinds of leadership that may not actually foster great results as well right um and, and so I think part of it is a lot of what I teach is both understanding how numbers have been weaponized against us, how, how we've made them, you know, how they've become really uncomfortable for us, and how to be comfortable with context, how to be comfortable with uncertainty that you're looking for ranges of outcome, you're defining failure is absolutely in the possible outcome set, and that you should focus on process and the behavior rather than the single point outcome. And this way you have your own back. So, so the idea is that you're captaining a small sailboat on the Pacific Ocean. You have no control over the waves, the winds, anything else, right? But you can learn to read the sky. You can learn to read the sea. You can get as well prepared as you can, and you can just trust that you're going to do the best you can. And if you're there, you have your own back, and there's a certain kind of peace of mind that comes with that because it isn't about, you know, um, uh, it isn't about a, a character flaw. So, um, you know, if you have a, a your your kid shows up with a fever of 102, you don't automatically assume it makes you a terrible person, right? You start to get really curious, right? How long have you had the fever? What are the other symptoms? Should we go to the emergency room, right? You you know, you you do all of that, and yet when it comes to business or personal finance, often the assumption is, I'm a disaster. I don't know how to do this. I'm a fit, right? Instead of Let's get curious. <laughs> I'm just curious about that fever, right? That my child's fever doesn't mean that I'm a terrible person. <laughs> right? So you're already approaching the world differently when you can make that shift about, you know, business outcomes suddenly become less. You can, if you develop curiosity, foster curiosity rather than judgment in all aspects, uh, you just have, uh, you go through life with a much less mind drama <laughs> if you can do that. I love that displacing some of the other emotions with curiosity yeah. is a, is a healthy move. Let's um, let's jump into segment four. In financial decision making, investment behaviors reveal distinct patterns between women and men. Contrary to the traditional view of women as more risk averse, recent insights suggest a more complex picture. Women's investment choices are influenced by various factors, including socioeconomic status knowledge of investment products, and life circumstances. The composition of investment teams also shows interesting trends. In impact investing, for example, female investors demonstrate greater risk-taking, especially when focusing on social impact ventures. The perception of women as inherently more cautious in financial matters is undergoing a transformation. Research indicates that women, when provided with the right opportunities and knowledge, can exhibit risk-taking behaviors similar to their male counterparts. This evolving understanding of gender dynamics is essential for developing tailored financial services. Acknowledging these differences not only leads to more effective financial advice, but also fosters inclusivity in the world of investments, catering to the unique strengths and needs of both women and men. So this, I guess, expected risk aversion has come up already. Mariko, you managed a team of portfolio managers and analysts. How do you perceive the differences in investment behavior between men and women? And what implications do these have on managing one's own finances and for the financial industry? I know that's a lot. Right. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give you a short answer this time now. Um, so I think, um, so I, I should just tell you the story because this, this, uh, I have a storage unit, right? And, and the guy who owns the storage unit, because I still haven't gotten rid of enough stuff, it's a boomer problem. Um, and he, um, uh, he likes to 
day trade. So I was asking him about the community and so on and what the demographics were and the men and women and so on, you know, and it's mostly men, et cetera. And, and he said, you know, cause women are so much more emotional than men when it comes to investing. <laughs> and I was like, stop right there, George, you have this so wrong. Right. And then he got, he got the lecture. Um, and, and there's this idea that women are, 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 are going to be too emotional you know, God forbid you should buy or sell a stock during your period or something. I don't know where people get these crazy ideas. And in fact, it turns out that men tend to be the one to be itchy fingered. They need the, the, the compulsion for action, right? And and um, the impatience, the sort of that, that women tend to be better long-term investors because they tend to sort of stick with the play, which again, gross generalizations, Right. But they tend to sort of stick with the plan. They tend to do a little bit more research. They're more patient. There's less of a need to 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 sort of take action. They get less emo their egos. I'm going to. OK, let me I'm gonna go right out there and say it. Right. Are less, um, um, uh, you know, less involved with whether things are, are whether their, their portfolio is going up or down. Uh, and that that makes it, you know, they're 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 better. Uh, investors that way. I, I think, again, gross generalizations, but this ability to not take action is um, uh, just randomly compelling, you know, kind of like the, the sort of social media scrolling that we have to, the compulsion, right? If you can harness that compulsion, um, you're going to be a better long-term investor. You're going to be more diversified. You're not going to fall for fear of missing out. You're not going to go with the latest thing that people are bragging about at the golf course, that kind of thing. Having said that, though, I have heard recently of two guys who, um, who were regular Joes, like working, you know, linemen for a utility company and working their way up, that would get their their statements, you know, they would put put the money away as much as they could, and they just wouldn't look at them. <laughs> they never opened them so that they would never be tempted to take unnecessary action. And and um at all, like over literally like 30 years and then when it got close to to that time opening up the statement and you know seeing that they were worth i don't know two and a half million 3.2 million something like that right so it was almost it was an interesting and and this is i've heard two of these stories recently so this idea that you can create habits that help support you to counteract our human psychology or desire to do things um, is an interesting one. And th in those cases, those two happen to be men, but it's, it's uh, so just to, you know, balance out the, my, my stories here. Yeah. I think for the majority of people, when it comes to investing, less is more. Um, as a side note, I think my wife is a better trader than me because she's, she tends to be more active and her actions are usually pretty correct. Her timing <laughs> seems to be good, um, to her credit. Uh, Stephanie, what misconceptions about women in investing do you encounter most frequently? Well, to your point, there's definitely this perception that women are have no risk tolerance and what we see again in the studies is that you know women will self-identify even as having low risk tolerance. She she knows it's my turn to speak, so I think that's why she's she's piping up here. Uh, she's been quite quiet. The rest I of timed this. it perfectly. Oh my goodness! Um, so my point being that uh, I, there was this analysis by the investing app Stash of their their customers, and they found that ninety percent of women Stash users self identified as having a low or medium risk tolerance compared to seventy five percent of men. But the numbers don't line up with their actual investment behaviors. Uh, about 50% of women invested in higher risk investments on Stash, which was the same rate as men. And this is reflected in meta-analysis of economic studies across the board, that these differences in risk tolerance between men and women are negligible and more likely to do with self-perception than actual behavior. So that to me says, what is the consequences of these narratives and myths that women are not confident, women are risk averse, women are not engaged with their finances? The consequences is, is that we're hearing this message and we're starting to internalize it. And that's where I think we really need to be aware of, of not just the myths, but how we are responding to them. That's really, it's really interesting 
data to see that difference. And I guess it, it goes to show the importance of having a community where Absolutely. women can speak to one another, compare notes and say, oh, I maybe I'm not that risk averse. I'm doing fine. I see that in a lot of the women business owners I teach where they're like, oh, I just don't understand this, you know, and they are t complete badasses. And part of the great joy in my job is to show them how actually how well they're running their businesses and how well they understand what's going on in their businesses. But there's such a gap between the perception of somehow how that should feel if you're doing it well and how the actual doing it well looks like. You know, I, I think that what you just said, Enrico, is important because it's this this feeling thing. Because what I've found in the studies I've done on uh, women and gender and things is that for the most part, this again is a generalization, most women don't have this sense of confidence. And in fact, that's not that important for a woman because they tend to have a little more holistic way of looking at things or more systemic thinkers. They can see if I do this, this will happen. They can see the implications of things, but because they can see all of that, they never feel completely like hundred percent certain that this is how it is. You don't feel that surety. And they're finding out that even that sense of certainty isn't really that you're certain. It's actually a, an emotion that you're feeling that has nothing to do with being right or not. So there's something about how women have more sensing in, in gen, you know, of course, this goes across genders in different ways. They have a deeper sense of sensing and can feel things differently. So they never feel like 100 percent. This is it. But they can live with a little bit more ambiguity with that. And what we found is more important is what the studies are showing is rather than self-confidence about it is self-efficacy. You know, that belief in yourself, believe that you can. I might be scared. I might be nervous. I might be a little freaked out. I might be whatever, but I can do this. I have capacity. I'm capable to, to go with that. And I think the other point that I wanted to, and you put this out in the very beginning, Andy, but really looking at what women invest in, their values sometimes can be different. I, I, um, I'm kind of friends with Mohammed Yunus and really talking to him about micro investing and the Grameen Bank and what he looked at just you know, overall and the investing they did with women all over the world is that when they invested in women, what women then invested in were things that actually contributed to the community to the world around them, not just themselves, certainly their families, but it helped the community. So their values are something greater than just their own amassing their own wealth for whatever their, if we could call that ego or whatever, it's more about how can I serve my family? How can I serve my community? The values are different in the kinds of things that they invest in and their investments oftentimes, in my experience, Mariko and Stephanie know more, tend to really, those values matter to them. What's going to make a difference? So that I have found is a gender difference. And I think also that, especially in business, uh, running your business in accordance to your values that may not sort of be textbook kind of, you know, kind of finance bro, <laughs> kind of, you know, on paper, the optimal way to do it, right, can, can be... Um, shamed can can be can cause a lot of shame that somehow you're doing it wrong and and it's it's you don't have to go for the last nickel or optimize for the you know the best return in the short term you can have a different set of how you look at things and and part of it is you know it, you know part of the lesson is okay over the long haul you want a sustainable business you you do need to have positive free cash flow, but really you get to run the business in accordance with your values. If you just do that, you get to choose, uh, you know, it's your business. You get to smash it's your party, smash the pinata however you want to. And, and, but there's a sense of shame that somehow you're doing it wrong. And, um, you know, because you're not doing it in this textbook way, which can be very extractive, very, exploitative, you know, just just not kind of a humane form of capitalism that would still work, but is looking at, at, at things in a broader, you know, that we're all in this together, you know, and on this planet, and somehow we're going to have to make it. Um, and, and I, and I really, it, it really bothers me when I see that, that being used to sort of shame, um, you know, shame people who are trying to do business differently. Love that. Love smash that pinata any way you want to. Okay. Let's let's uh, bring it home and go to segment five. Estate planning is a vital tool for women to secure their future and legacy. It's not just for the wealthy, but for everyone who wants to ensure their wishes are respected. A comprehensive estate plan typically includes a last will and testament, trusts, power of attorney, healthcare directives 
beneficiary designations, along with a detailed schedule of assets. These components work together to manage and distribute assets effectively, both during and after life, while also providing crucial guidance for healthcare decisions and personal responsibilities in case of incapacitation. The most common oversight is the absence of an estate plan, leaving significant decisions in the hands of others. Estate planning is about safeguarding your interests, family, and assets. Life changes such as marriage, divorce, or a spouse's death necessitate revisions to the estate plan. Regular reviews, especially after age 60, are crucial to ensure that the plan adapts to current circumstances and legal developments. Regular updates keep the plan effective, reflecting the ongoing changes in life. Judith, you're writing a book for women right now. You also do a lot of coaching and training in transformative leadership for women. What lessons can you draw that can help women to address financial, uh, to address estate planning and legacy? And I think this is a very good question. It's actually a very good one for me right now because my husband and I have gone through some different shifts and we're re-engaged in a whole nother level of our estate planning right now, looking at all of it, just like you're talking about. So I'm kind of in the process again myself right now. And I, part of it, part of what I look at, part of how I support people with it is what I'm experiencing. It's stirring to do estate planning, you know, to think about your death, what will happen. I mean, there's emotional components to it that you can't ignore. It's not just a financial thing or whatever. It's very stirring to really be able to deal with those feelings or to think about your dying or your spouse dying or what happens or your relationship with people and where do you want your legacy and what is your legacy. These are big, big issues. And that's oftentimes why people don't deal with them, but they really need to be dealt with. So what I look at is really uh, someone really understanding themselves more fully um, and looking at these values that actually Stephanie talked about before, that also Mariko, just what you talked about being, you know, being able to do things differently, look at what it is really that you value. What, what do you want? What do you want to say at the end of your life, for example, what do you want that legacy to be? So even as I'm working with someone in their leadership development or with executive coaching or working with women or women executives, whatever, I'm always looking at, you know, who are you? What matters to you? What is the end game that you're going toward? And how can you use your finances? How can you use your business to really help you become the person you want to become? So it's synthesized. It's not like separate. My money's separate. My job's separate. It's all part of your own transformation, really looking at your own becoming so that every business move you make, every investment move that you make, it plays into that bigger theme of who you are, who you're becoming, what matters to you. And that tends to bring a lot more integrity to people and they feel more um, uh, whole, more, more integral, more whole in that way. So that's part of what I look at as part of your own identity and work with the emotions, but also look at the vision of who you are and who you're becoming and how do your investments and how does this development, how does that all play together? And how does that, how does that play out? I mean, you're even doing deathbed visualizations with people, like how do you want that to be at the end of your life? What is it that matters? And then letting your decisions guide toward those kinds of values. It's not easy to think about that. Something like a global pandemic forced a lot of yes. people, including me, to really say, okay, uh, death is possible. I better get on it and make sure that our will and everything is set up. Stephanie, why do you believe that estate planning is a critical aspect of financial empowerment for women? I do think that we tend to think of estate planning as something that we will deal with at the end of our working years or the end of our working life. And I think for women especially who do tend to be primary caretakers within households are very concerned about the security of their family long term. This is a process that needs to begin as soon as you start to earn your own money. So this could be in your 20s and 30s. You know, I'm midlife. I just had my first child. You know, I'll be 40 shortly. And so like you don't think of that as the time to plan my will. But it actually, you know, I, I probably should have started before this moment because it's not just about the decisions that I'm going to make, not just because as a woman, I'm going to live longer, but it's also about 
uh, you know, it's not all future based. It's also about what I'm doing now. A lot of the times we talk about women taking time out of the workforce to care for their children, and that's a really important. Uh, that's important work, but it isn't compensated. And oftentimes we oversimplify the long-term implications. We say, oh, well, I'm not making as much money as childcare costs, so it's not worth it for me to continue working for these years. But it's not just about that immediate cost. It's about this long-term cost. It's about the employer retirement contributions that are also made during those years if you remain in the workforce. It's about the time you spend in your career and remain attached to the labor force and the growth potential of those years. And again, this is not to say that staying engaged in the labor force is critical for everyone for the entirety of their working years, but I think sometimes we oversimplify to the immediate moment we're in and we lose perspective of the long-term future. So I think estate planning has to be top of mind even for people who are, you know, right in the thick of their careers. Well said. Mariko, any specific elements that people should be focusing on in regard to estate planning? Um, I think it really depends on where you are and in, 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 because it, th this is the other thing, right? The, the planning is going to shift over time uh, and your goals and your life. So it's, it's an iterative process. So if, um, but I always feel that it's just sort of good hygiene that you should have a will right you should have a healthcare proxy uh you should be, let people know whether you want the plug pulled or not um if there are any charities that you care about um that that is just when because if you're in the practice of if you have a will at 25 right it's just not you don't get that superstition at 55 going oh now i'm gonna have a will oh no now i'm now i'm going to somehow invoke an early death right and there's so many people who who were successful business people but somehow like just the idea of dying was just too much for them and so they didn't do the estate planning to like take care of taxes and then they end up messing up their heirs or i had a friend who in his early 40s you know he he had had just, you know, had, had a child that was less than, you know, a year old, got, you know, got married, had a late in life. He was an attorney and he died very suddenly. Mm -hmm. He hadn't updated his will and he had left um, his estate to his nieces and nephews because at the time, you know, he was single. Well, they're minors, right? So for them, they can't waive benefit. So it was a mess. Um, so part of it is just I just feel it's just good hygiene, even if you don't need something complicated. If you do it, then it, you're in the habit of doing it. And if every five years you're kind of re-looking to see where are you in terms of your net worth, in terms of your income possibility, you know, as time shifts, the things that you worry about and that you focus on shift. Um, and so I don't, uh, this is a long way of my saying, I don't have one answer for you. <laughs> Because it depends on where you are. I, I think that the thing is, I, I would just say start with always have a will, uh, you know, a durable power of attorney, uh, uh, health care instructions, um, and, uh, you know, at, at, at a minimum. And, and just start that as just out of the gate. You should just have that the same way you should, you know, file your taxes every year. You know? um, and then that makes it easier. And, and if every few years, every five years or so, or every time you have a big life change, you, you actually sit down with someone. And this is the thing, I think people sort of hate to spend money on, on, on sitting down with someone and you don't need to have a thousand and one Monte Carlo simulations about whether you're going to have enough money or not. Just having a sounding board, you know, kind of like a financial checkup the way you would a physical checkup um, it just makes so much sense. You just, you know, so many people just don't have anybody to talk to about their money because they didn't grow up with it in their family or they just, you know, or the family's not going to be helpful <laughs> that way. And, um, I, I just think it's important. You don't have to do this alone. And, um, oftentimes you can find out that you're in far better shape than, than you thought that just actually knowing where you are, um, lets you make better decisions in, in the future, particularly when you have a sense of where you want to go and why. Back to what Stephanie and, and Judith have said around it being connected to your values and your why. Um, so that would be the other thing I would really encourage everyone to do is every five years, you know, just, just do that. 
um, as well. Not to be self-serving, but I really do think it can make a big difference. <laughs> you know? Yes, and make sure to update your beneficiaries. Yes, um, yes. Your various accounts, because it's something that's easy to be forgotten. And I had, yes. I had a client who passed away two years ago, and he hadn't updated his beneficiaries on one of his accounts because his beneficiary was his wife who died before him. And then his family has been trying to take care of his estate for some time, and it's finally getting resolved now. So make sure to, that's an easy update for everybody. Yep. I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and just some quick takeaways. We covered a lot over this, over the course of the hour. I think that, um, you know, we talked about the external, which is the societal, societal norms and the expectations. Um, but importantly, it's a lot of the inner work, um, examining what your values are and what's important to you. Um, because that's one way if you, if you're focused on the inside, a lot of the time, it helps you to break through of the things that are happening outside of your control. And, um, you know, just to, to know what's important to you to, and to do your own thing. Um, I appreciate all the panelists sharing their insights and their expertise. You can find Dr. Judith Wright at liveright.com. That's W-R-I-G-H-T. Keep an eye out on or keep an eye out for her book. I don't know when that's going to be released, but it, it, I'm sure it's going to have a lot of value. Mariko Gordon, CFA. You can find her at MarikoGordon.com. And Stephanie O'Connell Rodriguez. You can find her and follow her at TooAmbitious.com. Kudos to Stephanie for joining us this evening with a three-month-old baby. Um, I'm sorry for the interruptions. And of course, she's now sleeping. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so we should go another hour. <laughs> well, we hope that the baby sleeps well. Thank, um, you. thank you again, Dr. Judith, Mariko, and Stephanie for joining us. Thank you, Inspired Moneymakers, for watching us and listening to us, whether it's on YouTube or on your favorite podcast player. Make sure to join us next week, Wednesday, March 13th. We'll be back at 6 p.m. with, this is this is a little different topic, a taste of success, Andy's first wine investment. We're going to see how that goes from a guy who does not really drink wine. But until next week, do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. Absolutely. Absolutely.